Now, we're going to continue our study in the book of Galatians. Turn to uh, Galatians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible this morning and you would like to follow along with us, just raise your hand. A couple of the guys are already ready to go with a stack of Bible, Bibles in their hands. So if for some reason uh, you don't own a Bible, you don't have a Bible, you want to follow along, just raise your hand and um, we'll go through this together. Back, backdrop here. Remember, Paul has planted this book, the book uh, uh, in Galatians. He's planted this church in Galatia, and he planted it with uh, the premise, with the foundation, really, that we as Christians are saved by grace alone in Jesus alone, and that nothing else brings us to salvation, nothing else brings us into a right, a correct relationship with the God of the universe, the one who made the heaven and the stars, nothing brings us back into correct, right relationship with God except for the grace of God and what God has done on the cross. And so Paul plants this church just teaching them the beauty of the real gospel. And Paul continues to move on and plant other churches and to build up other leaders like Timothy and Titus. And while he's gone, uh, these Judaizers, these, these Jewish men who practice the Jewish faith creep into the church And they begin to teach the church that they are not saved by grace alone. But in order to be saved, they actually have to add to their faith. Specifically, they have to add the law of Moses, the Mosaic law, the laws of cleanliness and purification in addition to all of that circumcision as well, that you're going to have to do all of these things to actually be saved. And men in the church, even leaders in the church, including Barnabas, Paul says, one of his close comrades, begins to turn away from the gospel of grace and add the law. And even Peter, we saw a couple weeks ago, Peter is rebuked directly by Paul for turning away from this reality that we are saved by grace alone. And now this morning, uh, as we read, we're going to see that we are ultimately redeemed from the curse of the law by the cross, and that there's a curse that exists because of the law of God, and then there's a redemption that occurs, a buying out of this curse that Jesus has done for us. So this morning, if you're able to this morning, would you stand with me as we honor the the reading of God's word? Chapter 3, verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming the curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Now, Lord, I ask this morning, please allow the preaching of your word to do its effective work upon our hearts and souls. We trust you this morning to draw us near to yourself, to remove distraction and distortion of the scripture, that we would see you and you alone, and we would worship you and you alone. We trust you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, the church said, amen. Um, I want you to notice something here. Paul says, okay, remember now, Paul's trying to accomplish a couple different things as he writes this letter. One is he's trying to bring the people of Galatia back into this right relationship with Jesus that we are saved by grace and grace alone. He's also trying to establish the fact that he is an actual apostle and that he has authority. And he has this deep concern for his church. Uh, which, which, which just by way of conversation, by way of reminder, the church, which is you, should demand of its pastors and leaders not only to be effective teachers of God's word, but also effective shepherds of God's people. Do you know what I mean by that? I mean that, that you should have, you should ask for, you should pray for God to establish leaders within your church and within your churches that not only do a good job teaching God's word, but do a good job loving you. You with me? You want a pastor that loves you? Uh, Yeah? You seem a little confused. (laughs) 
what does this mean for a pastor to love me? It means a couple things. It means that, number one, the pastor is going to try to the best of his ability, along with, and if you're part of Sierra Bible Church, this is basically how we operate, along with the pastoral team and along with the eldership that is established within this church. So some churches, they don't even know what their leadership structure is. We have a leadership structure. And we believe it's a biblical leadership structure, and that is that, that, that so for instance, I'll give you an example. My son the other day, uh, he said to me, as we were walking outside of Awana, he said to me, uh, hey, Dad, can, can we go get this thing now? And I said, I said, no, we'll get it later in the week because I have access to it because I work at the church. And he goes, oh, yeah, that's right. You're the head pastor of the church. That's what he said. And as we were walking out, I said, no, I'm not the head pastor of the church. Jesus is the head pastor pastor of the church. Amen? So Jesus is the head of the church. Then Jesus establishes, he, he anoints, if you will, under shepherds, of which I am the chief under shepherd. He said, Jesse, I'm going to call you, not because you're perfect, not because you're awesome, not because everybody loves you, but because I see it fit that you would be the chief uh, under shepherd under me, and you would teach the word of God and lead the church. And then we have the Bible that teaches through Paul who's written this letter, that we're to have elders, which are men who are qualified to teach and preach and know the word of God to help me shepherd the church and to hold me accountable to good biblical teaching and preaching and loving and relationships, right? Doug is one of those men. Say hi to everyone, Doug. Right? <laughs> I all, sometimes I'll say he's an Englishman, and he'll correct me and say, no, I'm a, I'm a Scot. Right? And when he rebukes me, it always sounds way cooler than when, than when Brad Beers rebukes me. Brad is also an elder. Everyone say hi to Brad. You guys know Brad. He's, he's also one of our elders. These are, these are men along with, well, here's another one up front. He's a firefighter guy. Uh, what's your name again? Your name is, uh, 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 oh my gosh, it's Russ. <laughs> Struggle there for a moment. When you're up here, you have no idea the kind of things that go into your mind and disappear. And then they come back, hopefully. These are men that God has established to, to lead the church, which means, and to help, help hold me accountable, which means these men should be teaching, committed to the word of God and committed to loving you. And whether you know this or not, we do the best that we can in the size of the church that we have. We have a list of names, people who, who call Sierra Bible Church, our church, and our elders have those names segmented every so often, and we pray over you, and hopefully occasionally we call you, contact you, email you, just say, how are you doing? And, and so all that to be said, Paul has this, this kind of love and affection as a pastor-type shepherd for the church of Galatians. He is, he is shocked and dismayed that the church is going the way that it is going. And every now and then, you, you should have a pastor, a leader, or someone in the church just call you on stuff and say, what you're doing is not in accordance with the gospel, and you need to repent of that and turn yourself back and face back towards Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. Are you with me? Now, I'll add this as a side note because it's really, really important. It, it is... It is by God's design for you, by a gracious gift of God, to have pastors and leaders in your church who will love you, lead you, guide you, and care for you, okay? That's such a gift. If someone passes away in your family, you know that the office is open, you can contact somebody, you can email somebody, and we're going to do everything that we can to be there for you in that situation, right? Right? When, when, ladies in the church, when you have your first baby here, we throw a baby shower for you, and we get you a gift. We love you. Now, now that is a great, gracious gift of God, but do you know, this would be so much better if it wasn't me saying it, uh, but because I'm, I'm teaching it, I have to share it, but do you know you have an obligation for, for you who are loved by these leaders, for you also to love and care for these leaders back? Are you with me? So it's, it's, it's our job to love you, and it's your job to love each other as well as to care for the, your pastors as well. Because your pastors and your leaders are giving, and they're giving, and they're giving, and it's important for you, for you to give back to them as well. In fact, one of the things that, that I haven't done yet was just to request from you as a church, don't call me on Friday. It's one of my days off, okay? Just leave me alone on Friday. Why? So I can love you? 
so I can love you Saturday through, through Thursday, and I can do, and I can do it for a, a, the long haul. Are you with me? Because, because if I'm contacted every day of the week, which I am, um, then, then that takes away time for me to be healthy with my wife and to be healthy with my kids, and I am totally on a tangent, and, uh, and I need to get back to my notes, which I haven't used at all yet, okay? But every now and then, I'll just say, I'll say to you that, that, that there are these moments where sometimes in preaching and teaching, um, where the scripture uh, allows itself for me to remind us of things uh, that, that are important that I maybe haven't shared in a while or, or within time. And so I think it's just appropriate to share that. Paul has a love for the church, and this comes out. It's one of the reasons why he's written this letter. He, he's passionate. And he now says in verses 10 through 11, back to the notes, he says, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. Now what he's saying is, he's saying is, if you, if you are living by the law of God, if you are trying to earn God's love, if you're trying to find a way to climb that mountain to get to the Lord, and you're doing things to try to feel like you're in a right relationship with God, if you've come to church to try to be in a right relationship with God, Paul says, this is like living under a curse. And when Paul says this, he's echoing into those Judaizers, he's speaking into the Judaizers, and he's speaking into these Gentiles who are being influenced by the Judaizers, and he's actually echoing us back, or he's taking us back into Deuteronomy 27. Now, in Deuteronomy 27, what you have is you have the people of God moving into the promised land, okay? So so if you don't remember, the the Jewish uh, tribes of of men and women were in bondage. They were in slavery to Pharaoh. Moses shows up on the scene, and he takes them into the promised land. And as he's taking them into the promised land, there, there are 12 tribes, that are part of, of the, the, uh, the people. And six of the tribes stood on one side of the mountain, and six leaders of the other tribes stood on the other side of the mountain. And as the people were entering into the promised land, one group of, of individuals declared the promises of God. This is, this is what God promises of you or for you. The other side, and, and Paul knew this, the other side they declared all the curses from the Old Testament. Let me read some of them to you from Deuteronomy 27. Cursed be the man who makes a carved or cast metal image. Cursed be anyone who dishonors his father or his mother. Anyone done that? Anybody? (laughs) Cursed is anyone who dishonors his father or mother. Cursed is anyone who perverts the justice to the sojourner, the fatherless or the word widow. Cursed be anyone who does not conform the words of the law by doing them. And the Levites recited a dozen of these things in total. And in essence, all of it says is it basically the essence of all of it is if you ever miss the mark, if you ever sin against God, you are under a curse. You have been cursed and you are, you are due destruction. Paul was so intimately acquainted with this. You want to know why he was also acquainted with it? There's a passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul shares, because he, he shared the gospel everywhere that he went, the Judaizers grabbed Paul because, of, because he did it, and five times, what happened to him? Do you remember? He was beaten 40 times minus one, 39 times. He was whipped by the Jews. And what many of us don't know is that when that practice occurred, when you were punished by being whipped, while you were being whipped, the curses were read aloud to you as you were being whipped. You have not lived according to God's word. You have not done what God has done. And each time Paul was whipped, he would hear these curses read aloud And what ultimately Paul is saying here is he's saying a couple different things that the rest of Scripture teaches is that all of us, I have these curses here on on a slide for you, all of us are guilty of these things. All of us have done these things 
wrong. All of us have broken the law of God. Last night we did, uh, and, and someone mentioned that this would be a great analogy last night, and so I'm going to use it, um, plagiarize it here a little bit. Last night we, uh, we went and celebrated Zach Osnes' birthday. Happy birthday, Zach. And, and, and we celebrated by, uh, by doing axe throwing. So there's these lanes. You throw axes. I've never felt so unsafe in my entire life. <laughs> there's all these rules. There are rules. But at the end of the day, some people, when they throw an axe, the axe doesn't go in the wall. The, wa- the axe bounces back at you. And there's a sign that says, don't try to catch an axe, right? If it, yeah, we live in that kind of day and age. Wisdom would say, don't catch the axe while it's in the air. And, uh, and so anyways... Uh, we, we, were, we, were, uh, we're, we're all throwing, and it's difficult to, to, to make sure that that axe goes into the wall. And on, on most occasions, uh, no matter how hard we tried, uh, very few of us were able to actually hit the center of the bullseye to hit the mark. That's what the law of God is. The law of God is the perfect target, and it says, okay, you, you see the outer ring? That's not good enough. You see the next ring? That's not good enough. You see, the, it's not good enough. To be close to God, you've got to hit the center every single time. And, and none of us were able really to do it. There was a few of us that did. Zach did it, I think, a couple times, didn't you? You don't want to brag. I got it. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, and and, and, and it's, it's that, there was that reminder that if we're going to be right with God, and Paul is saying, you can't do it. And since you can't do it, it's a curse to you. It's heavy to you. The shorter catechism says it like this. No mere man since the fall is able in his life to perfectly keep the commandments of God, but doth daily break them. Listen, this is important because not only have we broken the law of God in deed, but it says in thought and in word in addition to deed. So not only have you done the wrong thing, you've thought the wrong thing, and you've said the wrong thing. The Bible says in every single way, you're completely depraved, you're completely broken. And this is the curse that exists for you. You deserve death, you deserve destruction, you deserve to be punished because you're so out of bounds. And you're so out of bounds that, that what happens oftentimes in Christianity is we think that if we're legalists, we think if we do all the right things, we think if we have the right culture in the church, that we can somehow force ourselves, maneuver ourselves into a right relationship with God, and the reality is you absolutely cannot. You can never do it. Tim Keller has a great quote here. He says, many many Christians, though not all, this might be true for some of you uh, here this morning, testify that when When they first became aware of their need for God, they went through a time of immaturity in which they became extremely religious. They diligently sought to mend their ways and do religious duties to clean up their lives. They made tearful surrenders to God at church services. They gave their lives to Jesus and asked him to uh, into their hearts. Does anyone remember that phase? Uh, I can remember it, right? Because some of you know my story. Uh, I I became a Christian when I was 12. Because my mom became a Christian when I was 12. And my mom put away all of, all of the drugs, all of the alcohol, all of the partying. And I remember it was like, it was a stark contrast between the mom of old and the new mom who got saved. And all of a sudden, my mom, who, who has always hung out with motorcycle kind of guys. Okay, so, so my father who raised me built Harleys from the ground up. And this is when... Like, the only kind of people who rode Harleys were, like, really tough dudes with beards, not lawyers and things like that, but actually tough guys, okay? People who like to hurt other people. That was my life growing up. And, and my mom all of a sudden went from this biker girl. I remember going down to West River Street, not West River Street, uh, I can't remember the name of the street, right off downtown. There was a lady there, and she was known for hand-making, uh, m- you know, leather just for motorcycle guys, right? Chaps and, and, and vests and, and bags, saddlebags for motorcycles. I mean, tough lady. And next to her lived a gentleman. Some of you might remember his, him. He was an awesome guy. Uh, if you were on his good side, he was an awesome guy. If, if you weren't, he was a scary guy. And his name was Tattoo Richard. How many of you remember Tattoo Richard? Anyone remember Tattoo Richard? Tattoo Richard was a big, scary guy. And he ran a tattoo shop out of the bottom of his house. 
And he was the kind of guy that, you know, back then, when you got a tattoo, you got a tattoo because you deserve to get a tattoo because you were that kind of person. I remember people would show up and knock on his door, and, and he'd open it, and, and they'd say, I want a tattoo. And he'd look at him and go, no, you don't. And he'd close the door. <laughs> that was the kind of guy he was, okay? Those were the kind of people we hung out with. And then the next day, my mom, all of a sudden, her whole wardrobe turned into ankle-length dresses and special hats, <laughs> right? Because to be a Christian, to be a Christian when you're born again, I've got to clean up my life. I've got to, I've got to make everything right. And she threw out the old clothing, and, and to some degree, it was symbolic, but she went too far. She thought in her mind to be right with God, I've got to change all these things. She went into my room. She tore down all of my posters. She threw away my CDs. I mean, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. Come on, man. It just threw it all away. And what Keller says, he says, hey, when we first get saved, we start thinking, okay, well, God saved me. And now because he's done this great thing, I've got to work my way back to God. I've got to work my relationship with him to keep holding on to him. Keller continues, he says, but so often they were only resolving to be very good and very religious, hoping that this would procure the favor and blessing of God. At this stage, they tended to have a lot of emotional ups and downs like children, feeling good when they made a spiritual commitment and despondent when they failed to keep a promise of God. They felt a great deal of anxiety. They were, as Paul says here, uh, which he says later in the text, they were like children under a tutor. They were on their way to discovering God in the gospel, but they weren't there yet. They weren't there yet. And my mom wasn't there yet, and I wasn't there yet, and some of you weren't there yet. Some of you aren't there yet. What, what does all this mean? Paul is saying, first of all, he's saying a couple of things. He's saying, number one, to live according to the law, to live according to the law is a curse to you. You can't do it. In addition to that, he's saying you can't, you can't escape the curse of the law with your good deeds. You can't escape it. And then Paul gives us the solution. He tells us how we get out of the curse. How do we get out of this cycle of the law? Verses 11 through 14. Now, this is evident. No one is justified. Million dollar word. No one is made right. No one is made perfect. No one is made sinless before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. And then it goes on to tell us this amazing thing in verse 13. Christ has redeemed. Everyone say redeemed us from the curse of the law. How did he do it? By becoming the curse. It, it, now, notice it says he didn't take the punishment of the curse. He actually became. He became the curse. And we, he, he quotes for us Deuteronomy 21, which says that the speaking of, of a man who would be hung on a tree that if he was hung on a tree, there was a law that if he was hung on the tree, you couldn't leave him there because if you left him there, he'd be accursed. Deuteronomy 21, 23 says, his body shall not remain all night on the tree. This, is, this far precedes, this is way before Jesus actually hung on the cross for us. And Deuteronomy says, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day for a hanged man is cursed by God. Another way to say this is, you remember, some, you've heard someone say the old rugged cross. It's not just an old rugged cross, it's an old cursed cross. A cross that Jesus went to voluntarily taking your curse, your punishment, that you would receive God's blessings. And that is what's inferred in the passage, that Jesus gets the curse so you can get all of the blessings. He didn't just take the curse, but he became the curse. One commentary says, says this about a, a particular story in regards to uh, this reality of Jesus dying. There, there was the communist revolution of 1948. Two young men in 1948 were given the job of destroying Christian chapels. One evening at dusk, after, they've devast after they devastated a small chapel, they decided to sleep in it that night. So these men in the revolution, the communist revolution, destroyed this church and decided to sleep in that church 
to rest after devastating several chapels in the area. They were lying on the floor, and one of them saw a crucifix high on the wall, but they weren't able to reach it to destroy it, but they could still see it there hanging. And his companion, one companion said to the other, do you see the picture of God nailed to that stick of wood? Yeah, he said. The other responded, but what of it? And the first one who asked the question said, you know, I never saw a God who suffered before. This is something new. A Savior who voluntarily suffers. See, within Christianity, there isn't, again, there isn't this rule of this is what you have to do. No, no, no. It's, it's look at what he, he did. Look at the act of the cross. Look at the voluntary action of Jesus Christ going to the cross, becoming your curse, becoming your punishment. When someone says, why would you be in a relationship with this God? Why would you believe in religion? Because religion manipulates things and wants to be in power. And I would say, you know what? Unfortunately, due to a lot of mistakes and a lot of sinful men, that is exactly true. But when Christianity is preached in its purest form in regards to the gospel, we have a leader, which is Jesus Christ, who does not try to usurp authority over us, but rather has given himself to us that he would, as the text says, redeem us and heal us from the curse. That's the implications of the text. The text says in verse 13, first of all, that, that we were redeemed from this curse. If you look at, if you will, just look at the text below, Galatians uh, verse, chapter 3, verse 22. This is an interesting text here. But the Scripture imprisoned everything under sin. Do you see the word imprisoned? Again, what Paul is saying, he's saying, okay, listen, if you're going to try to earn God's love, one of the implications of, of being a sinner, one of the implications of trying to earn God's love is you are imprisoned, which literally means you are trapped. All walls around you are closed. The language that's used here is that you are, in a, you are in bondage by an impersonal force, and this impersonal force, which we know is Satan, creates a tremendous amount of anxiety in your life, being stuck in a cage. And I would argue with you that, that one of the reasons that our culture is just is the statistically going through the roof when it comes to loneliness, anxiety, and depression is because we understand that no matter how good we have it, it's never enough. Now, let, let me just implore something that I believe is true this morning. I believe almost probably everyone in this room is doing the best they can. Many of you probably have been very successful in your life. You've accomplished some really good things. And yet, I'm pretty confident that I could state, isn't there still a sense inside that there's something more? that there's still something more out there. And that something more is this right relationship we get through Jesus Christ because of his redemption. And Jesus redeems us. He, he has purchased us. And the Bible says it was a precious cost in which he paid. His literal blood, his perfect blood. And he purchased us out of that slavery and he has redeemed us, the text said. And then it also, it heals us from the curse. One of the things that sin does, one of the things that, 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 that evil does within us is it fractures us. It fractures our relationships. It fractures our mental state of being. It, it, it affects us holistically, body, soul, and mind. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, puts emphasis on this. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, listen to the next part, by his wounds we have been healed. Amen. Come on, everyone say amen to that. Amen. He heals you. He has the ability to, to make you whole and to fix you. And not, not, only, not only in the past, but now. And that's why the next statement, Paul says, listen, you're not going to be healed by working hard. You're not going to be healed by being super dedicated. You, you can't earn God's love. You, you can't get there. To do that is a curse. If you're trying to earn God's love, Paul says, you are living under a curse, and you shouldn't live under a curse because he became the curse. 
The curse has been dealt with, and so now God wants to heal you. God wants you to, to, to be liberated and to live in liberation, to live in joy, to not live in condemnation. And we go, well, how in the world do I do that? Verse 11. What does it say in verse 11? The righteous shall live by faith. What is faith? What is it to live in faith? And what's interesting is Paul is actually co- uh, quoting Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. You know what's happening, ha- you know what's happening in, ch- in chapter 2, verse 4? What's happening in chapter 2, verse 4 is that the people of God are, are about to be invaded and destroyed by the Babylonians. They are under what seems to be imminent, utter destruction. God is not going to save them from this. They are going to be put into captivity. And then the declaration in Habakkuk and the declaration to us is, even though there seems to be a life that seems destructive, a life that that seems filled with chaos, a life that seems to be more anti-Christ every single day, we are as righteous men and women who are made righteous because the curse of the law has been removed, because of this radical reality, we are to live by faith for we're righteous. What does that mean? Living by faith means that you, you, you have a life of self-renunciation. You put away the self, you put away all confidence in one's own merits and works, and you look away from the self, you look away from the self, and you look towards Jesus Christ. You no longer live life under your own thinking, under your own logic, under your own emotions. You live life according to the biblical word of God. See, living a life of faith is literally putting your sh- your- yourself in the shoes of the Israelites as they crossed over the Jordan River. You, you know what I mean by that? What I mean by that is if you remember the, the-, the Israelites as they were crossing over, what-, what was behind them? Pharaoh's army. What was ahead of them? The drowning sea. Behind us is the pursuing justice of God. In front of us is is the crushing perplexion of the future. What does the future have for me? And then faith through Moses, God goes, woo, and does the impossible. Does what only God does, opens up the waters and brings us over the dry land and places us into the promised land, which literally is for us this morning. It isn't an actual physical land. It's an actual person. It's God. He has brought us over the sinful waters. He has, he has brought us out of the pursuing justice of God into the promised relationship with Jesus himself. We have a promised land, and it isn't just heaven. It's Jesus himself. We've been removed from the curse. We've been given a tremendous relationship with God. In addition, in addition, saving faith is not just putting yourself in the shoes of the Israelites. It's also, it's also putting yourself in reliance and submission to the Lord your God. MacArthur says, when a sinner sees that he has no way to escape and no power in his own resources, he knows he must rely on God's provision and power. That's where we need to be as Christians. We need to be in that place where we say, I'm no longer relying on myself. And then we, we take this in faith, and we, t- we, we, we literally act upon it by, by being willing to transfer Jesus' sentence of death to ourselves and being hidden in Christ. We appropriate it for ourselves, that Jesus has done this. I, I have to believe that in my heart. That's what faith is. I have to believe that he's going to do it. And then lastly, saving faith is completely reliant and stands upon the radical, most important, truthful word of God. When it talks about faith in Scripture, Romans 10, 17 says this. How does faith come? It comes from hearing. From hearing what? The word of Christ. Before that, in Romans chapter 10, verse 14, it says, how will they, speaking of those who are lost, how will they who are lost call upon the one that they've never believed in, the one they've never heard of. How's somebody going to put their faith in Jesus? How's somebody going to get saved? And it goes on to say, unless unless they believe in him whom they've never heard, and how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? It is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. The Bible is filled with saying, saying, listen, 
if you need saving faith, you've got to hear the words of God. Uh, this is why we say all the time, we say, man, you know what? You have, you have to do everything you can to get the word of God in your mind because the word of God is truth. You've got to fight for it. You've got to discipline yourself to some degree, not, not to earn God's love, but so that you never forget God's love. Are you with me this morning? I know Murphy is. Are you? You got to do everything that you can. And some of you say, I don't have time to read. You got headphones. I know you got headphones because I see people with them in their head everywhere I go. You can listen to podcasts. You can, you know, there's a, there's a, um, there's an app called Street Lights. And, and some of you, some of you love, would love it. And some of you won't necessarily like it, but it's the Bible basically preached and spoke in spoken word to music. My wife will put it on in the kitchen. Right? I'm trying to watch football. <laughs> I get some street lights. I get some preaching of God's word. I take walks in the morning. I, I try to listen to things that they're going to increase my faith, increase my adoration for, for God, increase my love for Jesus. The reminder that the curse of God has been removed from Pastor Jesse Richardson, and the blessings of God have been placed upon me. And this morning, my friends, the curses of God are not for you. The blessings of God are for you, and you have to remind yourself of that. Who wants to walk around feeling like they're cursed? We look at the old cursed cross, and we see our blessing has come from the man who did not deserve the curse, should not have carried the curse, but he did it for us so that we can live in blessing. And God wants you to live in blessing. He wants your children to be blessed. He wants your marriage to be blessed. He wants your, your job to be blessed. He wants you to work for his glory. He wants you to love your neighbor. He wants you to be effective and fruitful in what you do. It doesn't mean life is going to be always easy, but in order for you to truly experience the blessings of Jesus Christ, you have to understand that Jesus Christ already has procured all of the blessings needed for you. You can't earn them. So stop. As we close and the team comes forward, here's your next steps for this week. Number one, I want you to explore. I want you to explore how, how does, here's the question here, how does God's law increase your gratitude to Christ? So what I'm trying to do is trying to get you, get you this week to just think along the lines of, well, what does God's law really do for me? The do's and the don'ts of Scripture, how how do the do's and the don'ts of Scripture increase my gratitude towards Christ? And it should be because Jesus has done all the do's and he didn't do all of the don'ts. What difference does this make to your, notice it's, it's in caps here for a reason, what does it do to your affections? Right? One, of, one of my primary jobs is to get you to fall more in love with Jesus Christ. Number two, ask, why do you obey God's law? Because it still has a place in the believer. And we'll see next week how God's perfect gift of grace is more superior to the law. But you need to ask uh, this week, how does, how do you obey, why do you obey God's law? And have you ever obeyed God's law for the wrong reasons? A good time just to ask, have you tried? Have you tried? And if you're like me, you have. To earn God's law, to earn God's love by, by doing rather than just, just being. There's a difference, and God would liberate you from those things. Let's, let's pray this morning. Lord, we, we thank you so much for, Lord, just for what you've done for us, just hearts filled with, with gratitude that you, you journeyed from the heavens, Lord, to come to this place of earth that, that, that truly suffers from the effects of sin. Lord, it, it is evident that our society and our cultures in the world are living under a curse. But we thank you, Lord, that on the cross, you have given us provision to no longer live under that curse, mm -hmm. but to live under your promises. I pray that that would become real to us this morning, real to us each day, that we would desire to truly live by faith. We trust you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. amen. <clears throat>